Most Americans take it on faith that breastfeeding is much better for babies than formula feeding. A couple of generations ago, it was exactly the opposite. Today's grandparents were overwhelmingly formula fed. But now, 79% of new moms start breastfeeding their babies, and about half of them are still at it six months later. I was born in 1965. My mother fed me formula, and when my daughter was born 40 years later, it was unthinkable to feed her formula. Everybody I knew had breastfed or at least tried very hard to breastfeed. Dr. Courtney Young is professor of political science at the University of Toronto and author of the book Lactivism, How Feminists and Fundamentalists, Hippies and Yuppies, and Physicians and Politicians Made Breastfeeding Big Business and bad policy. Young says breastfeeding may be good for babies, but the moral crusade to get new moms to do it has gone too far. I have received so many emails from mothers explaining to me exactly how awful their experience was of trying to feed their babies, maybe failing to breastfeed or finding it very difficult or deciding not to breastfeed or even deciding to breastfeed but feeling that it was a tremendous pressure and burden. Young says many new moms are no longer given the choice of breastfeeding or not. If they don't want to breastfeed or can't, hospitals may shame and pressure them into trying anyway. Women who don't breastfeed are stigmatized as bad mothers who don't care about their children. Hospitals and lactation consultants usually justify their actions by saying that breastfeeding is so much healthier for babies than formula feeding. But Young says sometimes the act of breastfeeding itself seems more important than what it might do for a newborn's health. In many cases, nurses and doctors and lactation consultants have insisted that a mother continue trying to breastfeed even long past the point where it's quite clear that the baby is actually starving and not getting enough milk. And they won't let the mother move to formula, and they never recommend that the mother move to formula, and they keep insisting that the baby is fine, and the baby is not fine, far from fine. When the mother finally turns to supplement with formula or switch to formula, as the case may be, the mother feels awful. And that's one of the worst effects that you find in the United States, and it's a very common story. But do the health benefits of breastfeeding really warrant such zeal? Young says there's really only one well-proven advantage. Breastfeeding almost certainly has an impact on the risk of infection. So it reduces the risk of ear, respiratory, and gastrointestinal infections for babies during the period that they are actually breastfeeding. On the flip side, there's also fairly good evidence that breastfeeding has no impact on obesity, type 1 diabetes, asthma, allergies, and cardiovascular disease, and dental cavities. And then... In the middle, there's sort of a vast area, all of the other conditions that have been associated with breastfeeding. Basically, the evidence is either weak or inconclusive. So I would say that for everything else, we basically just don't know. Still, Young says most advocates have completely bought into the purported benefits of breastfeeding. So they may truly believe that new mothers are irresponsible if they choose to raise their baby any other way. If you believe that breastfeeding is going to prevent your child from getting everything from cancer to cardiovascular disease to obesity and infections and that it's going to raise his or her IQ and increase his or her attachment, then It's very hard not to make the flip from I choose to breastfeed my baby to everyone should breastfeed their baby. But if it's, on the other hand, the case that it has a modest impact on reducing the risk of infection, then it seems more reasonable for mothers to weigh that modest impact against other things that are happening in their lives, that whether or not they have to go to work, whether or not they're producing enough milk, whether or not they need to take medications that may be contraindicated for breastfeeders, and what's going on with their families, and make their own decision about 
about whether or not breastfeeding works for them. However, Young says health justifications alone probably wouldn't produce such fierce insistence on breastfeeding. So where does it come from? Young says strong political views are responsible. Dating back to 1956, when two Catholic women started the La Leche League. It was first and foremost committed to breastfeeding, but it also was focused on breastfeeding was part of a larger philosophy, a broader philosophy that included the mother staying at home, nurturing the children, and the father having the role of a breadwinner. So it was a very traditional family structure. And subsequently, breastfeeding got picked up by the feminist movement as a marker of who we are and what we believe in and a sign of the power of women's bodies to sustain human life and breastfeeding as a symbol of what women can uniquely do. Even though feminists and evangelicals endorse breastfeeding for completely different reasons, groups as different as they are could probably never agree on any other subject at all. For example, parental leave. If the United States had a parental leave policy, paid parental leave, then mothers would be more free to make their own decisions about how best to feed their babies. It would be feasible to stay home and breastfeed your baby for six months. But at this point, the United States government recommends that mothers breastfeed exclusively for six months, and at the same time, they fail to provide paid federally mandated maternity leave. And mothers are expected to square that circle by breast pumping at work during unpaid work breaks so that somebody else can feed their baby breast milk from a bottle. And that's a very, very high price to pay for breastfeeding. That's one reason why Young sees a backlash developing against those who make moral judgments about formula feeding moms. It's certainly laudable to support women who choose to breastfeed. But women who make an informed choice not to breastfeed deserve support as well. You can find Dr. Courtney Young's book, Lactivism, at bookstores and online. Our production director is Sean Waldron. I'm Nancy Benson. Medicare and their list of suppliers continue to change. So if you have diabetes, it may affect where you get your testing supplies. But rest assured that your number one doctor-recommended one-touch testing supplies are always covered by Medicare Part B at your local pharmacy and approved mail-order suppliers. Dr. Brian Levy, Chief Medical Officer at LifeScan, maker of one-touch products. Some mail-order suppliers may offer a limited selection of diabetes testing supplies. They may try to switch you to a different brand, saying your current products are no longer covered. That's just not true. You are entitled to continue using the products you know and trust and that have been recommended by your healthcare professional at no additional cost. Remember, you have a choice. Stay with the number one brand used by Medicare patients. For questions about coverage or where to get your one-touch testing supplies, call 1-866-621-6216 or visit www.onetouch.com slash Medicare. Medicare Part B is not a guarantee of coverage and payment, which may be subject to coinsurance, deductible, and patient eligibility requirements. Health and fitness goals are often at the top of everyone's resolutions list. Older Americans share in those, too, and Silver Sneakers Fitness can help. Silver Sneakers is the nation's leading fitness program designed for older Americans. They can help you set goals and find motivation, whether it's playing with grandchildren, completing a race, or traveling for a dream vacation. Sims Corbett is senior learning designer for Silver Sneakers. One of the biggest predictors of success is planning to make fitness and health changes in a manageable and reasonable way setting small goals, and doing what you love. One of the easiest ways to get started is with our Silver Sneakers classes that are offered in neighborhood settings, from adult living communities and senior centers to park churches and more. Members can enjoy classes such as walking, hiking, yoga, and tai chi, just to name a few. Silver Sneakers has changed thousands of lives, and more than 12 million people are eligible for the Silver Sneakers Fitness Benefit through leading Medicare Advantage health plans, Medicare supplement carriers, and group retiree plans. Find out more at silversneakers.com. That's silversneakers.com. Is your daily routine putting you at risk for catching the cold or flu? Each year, there are 1 billion cases of the common cold or flu in the U.S., which typically begins when virus droplets are inhaled from a sneeze or cough or transmitted by touch. Placing yourself within close proximity to infected people or surfaces may put you at a higher risk. 
Curad Chief Nursing Officer and advisor to the American Nurses Foundation, Marty Moore, has a few suggestions for staying protected. We all know it's impossible to never leave your home or wear an outbreak contamination suit to ward off germs. But you can assess your risk and take simple steps to help protect yourself, such as using hand sanitizer, wearing a Curad antiviral face mask when out in public, and avoiding excessive workouts. Whether you're a working mom, stay-at-home dad, or college student, Marty advises all people to take a cold and flu assessment quiz and receive a personalized protection plan at curad.com.